All right, thank you all. Uh, my name is Sean O'Neill. <clears throat> this is work performed when I was a fellow at Ohio State. Uh, so on behalf of my co-authors, um, thank you for selecting our work. Uh, we have no uh, disclosures to report. Uh, medical therapy for GERD um, is insufficient up to 40% of patients, and despite good long-term results with anti-reflux surgery to the dismay of everyone in this room, very few patients actually end up undergoing these procedures. So, as a result, the concept of magnetic sphincter augmentation was developed to hopefully provide a more technically consistent, reliable, and reversible anti-reflux mechanism. Um, now, fundamentally, this is a foreign body encircling the GE junction so with a concomitant risk of erosion. So uh, it is imperative upon our field to watch these and see how the patients do over the long run. Uh, now, single arm studies have followed uh, MSA for up to 12 years with pretty good and durable symptom improvement uh, with erosion and removal rates generally in the mid to low single digits. Uh, now, direct comparative studies between fund application and MSA um, are few and generally don't go beyond one year. There is one study up to three years. So what we did um, was to examine outcomes at around the five-year mark. And we did that with a prospectively collected uh, registry for patients with straightforward symptomatic GERD eligible for either MSA or fund application. Uh, the operations were performed um, you know, five to seven years ago, and we assessed patients preoperatively one to three months post-op and at a five-year interval. Uh, we used two validated instruments to measure the severity and frequency of symptoms. Um, what you need to know here is that higher scores are worse and more severe symptoms, um, and also asked the patients if they, were as if they were satisfied and if they'd choose the same operation again. Uh, this is just the uh, Volanovic um, GERD HRQL um, scale that we uh, had the patients fill out. Uh, we also measured PPI use, need for dilation, reoperation, or device removal. Now, this was a non-randomized cohort, so at baseline, MSA patients tended to be more likely male, um, have a lower BMI, um, and there was a trend towards um, lower Demeester scores as well. And the symptom scale scores actually were lower in MSA patients, um, as well as lower dysphagia-specific scores. Now, immediately post-op, uh, PPI use was minimal, as per our post-op instructions. Um, but overall symptom scores, you do see a significant improvement right off the bat, um, 26 to 9 uh, with the Lynx device out of a scale of 50, and 34 to 6 uh, with fund application. Uh, patient satisfaction was moderate, and what's important here is that there are no significant differences between the groups. Now, this all completely correlates with what we know from one-year short-term follow-up studies with the Lynx device um, and fund application. So the question is, how does this hold up over the next five years? And for the most part, it held up pretty well. Uh, PPI use um, rose in both groups, but still less than 50%, and the overall symptom scores essentially did not change um, on average over, over five years. Uh, satisfaction with the device, the longer these patients live with it, uh, increased in both groups, and there were no differences between the groups. Showing the numbers here, I just want to point out we had 80% follow-up rate at five years. Uh, we did do a sensitivity analysis, excluding four patients who had follow-up at, say, like four years and 10 months, and that didn't change our results at all. And you can see the uh, PPI use is about 40% um, in MSA, 33% in lapnison, and the overall symptom score is still greatly improved. Uh, about three-quarters of the MSA patients were satisfied, 90% um, of the fund application patients were satisfied. Uh, we also saw no differences in need for dilation or need for reoperation. Um, five MSA patients did get reoperated on, including one um, interval hiatal hernia that was just repaired and the device left in place. And we performed four removals as well, um, all for different reasons. One at eight months for a patient who perceived himself to have a nickel allergy and ab absolutely demanded that it be removed, so we took that out. Um, and then for bloating, erosion, dysphagia, and recurrent reflux. And that all adds up to a removal rate of 16% in our sample, which is slightly higher than what's been reported in the literature. Uh, but again, this is a fairly small study. So uh, we did see stable improvement in symptoms, durable improvements over five years. Patients were largely satisfied, um, and it's kind of too, too hard to tell whether uh, this higher rate of 
device removal um, is a true effect or just a law of small numbers effect in our, in our sample. Uh, the limitations are this was a single institution observational retrospective trial, um, and it's you know, hard to determine whether these are true trends that will be borne out in the larger series of patients that exist out there, um, and time will tell. So in conclusion, we did see durable improvement um, we, in our, at our institution, remove the devices at a slightly higher rate. Um, and the question that you know, our field and everyone in this room is wondering about is how these patients do over the next five years and the next 10 years uh, to see whether this will truly uh, play out to be a durable um, treatment or not. So again, thank you so much for giving us a chance to present our data from our institution, um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you.